welcome and Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvah Tav Etzivanu Laasok B'divrei Torah. And we are doing this lesson, Le'ilui Nishmata of Naomi Zeman's Helman Gorin, mother of Judith Helman. And may her memory be a blessing. And also Le'ilui Nishmata of Barbara Radinsky, uh, wife of Harlan Radinsky, whose yard site is this starts this evening. And we're going to hit and do that. All right. And I'm going to go to the screen share now. Let's see how this works out. Yep. And you can see the screen. So remember, we're having this intense uh, revelation that Abra Abram at this point, right, still Abram is having with God and how uh, God is, uh, you know, how he's telling God how uh, he is concerned about not having a child, how God is has assured him that he will have a child and not only that, but his seed will be like the stars of the heaven. And then he tells him that 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 his offspring will in fact inherit this land on which he is now sojourning, and uh, God tells him to take various animals and uh, and to divide them in half, and that's what uh, is going to happen right now. That's where we're at with verse ten. Vayikachlo et kol ele. And he took all of these, Abram took all of these, and he cut them in half, placed them in half, right down the middle. And he placed each one's section, the Kratraehu, opposite its other section. So he divided them in half and then placed one half opposite the other half. However, with regard to the birds, he'd been told to take a uh, turtle dove and a pigeon. He did not divide those. And again, there's a lot of explaining to be done in this. Um, and uh, let's take a look at it. All right. Vaivater otan. And he divided them. Chalak kolechad lishnei chalakim. He divided each one into two parts. And this is the straightforward uh, meaning of the text. The fee and why? Because Keshaya Korit Brit Imo, right? Because in in creating this covenant, right, in setting up this covenant with him, Lishmor Haftato, this was to uh, secure, you might say, his promise, right? To guard his promise, Lohorish Levanav, to give as an inheritance to his offspring, et ha'aretz, the land. So this was Kidichtiv as it states, by Yom Hahu on that day, Karat Hashem et Avram Brit. God, and this Karat means to literally cut, and that has to do with cutting of the animals, and with Abram a covenant, lay more, saying, etc., etc. That's a verse we're going to come up to in, in a little bit. And again, in explaining the plain, straightforward meaning of this verse, the derch korte breed, and it was the practice of those who were establishing a covenant, who were setting up a covenant, a solemn oath to one another, the chalek behema, to split up an animal, to divide up an animal, ula avor bein betreha, or betareha, and to pass, to walk between those parts. In other words, it's like by your life, you are committing to do this particular thing. Kamash nemar lahalan, as is stated later on in the Tanakh, in the Bible, in Jeremiah 34, ha'ovrim bein betrei ha'ego, the ones who walked or passed between the parts of the calf. Afkan, here too, ha, uh, Tanur Ashan, we see that a, a flame of fire, or smokus, a flame, uh, or a pillar, excuse me, I'll call, uh, 
although tanur is sort of has more the meaning to do with a, an oven, right? A, so ashan would be smoke, the lapid a torch of of fire. They asher avar bein hagzarim. They passed between these parts of the animals. He shluchos shel shchina. This was the emissary of the divine presence shehu esh, which is fire. Fire is considered uh, an emissary of Hashem. Excuse me, one second. Okay. Uh, and it mentions why why the specific of the bird which he did not divide in half he didn't split it the umot of because when it comes to the nations of the idolaters nimshalu paparim they are uh, described as bulls the elim and rams with se'irim and and uh, uh, goats, shine'emar as it states. So he's going he's gonna to quote in Psalm twenty-two, sovavuni uh, sovavuni parim rabim. Many uh, uh, bulls have surrounded me, and in that psalm he's talking about his enemies, uh, enemy nations. So these nations are considered to be uh, they, there's the symbolism of uh, symbolized by various animals the omer and another part to support this idea in the book of daniel looks like chapter eight ha'ail asher ra'ita the ram which you saw in other words these visions that were, were seen what did the ram symbolize bal ha'kornayim with the horns there it says specifically it interprets the dream and says those are the kings of Mede, Medea, and Persia. The Omer had Safir, and uh, it says the buck, the Hasair, and the uh, goat, Melech Yavan. They represent the king of Greece. The Israel with regards to Israel. Nimshalu Livneyona. They are compared or, or described of as, as uh, doves. Shinemar, as it says, Shir Hashirim Bet, a Song of Songs, Chapter 2, Yonati, my dove, Bechagve Hasela, is in the clefts of the rock. Lefichach, and for this reason, Batar Habahemot, he split up the, he divided the uh, cattle. Remez to elude al obde kochavim regarding idolaters, sheyu kalim vehochim, that they would continually grow weaker and decrease in number. The atatsipor lo batar, but he did not divide up the bird. Remez, this was an illusion, sheyu Yisrael kayamim lo olam, that the Jewish people, Israel, would exist forever. So remember that Rashi had said that Abraham had asked God on what on what merit would the Israelites retain the land of Israel? And at that point he had said on the basis of the Korbanot, on the basis of the sacrifices. And here we are talking in a sense of animals that are being sacrificed for the sake of this covenant. So in a way that's that's being supported here. And if we wanted to possibly take it further uh, to talk about the fact that to act in a way, uh, again, the word korban is related to the word karev, which means to draw near, that the idea of the Jewish people drawing near to God in a way that they could only do in the land of Israel, uh, which they could not do to that degree elsewhere. And that, that sort of raises an interesting question as to uh, how we ought to behave given that we have the land of Israel. Uh, I realize, of course, that on a practical level, uh, rebuilding the temple is not a practical suggestion at this point. My sense is, even though there is, in a sense, a, a thought of a third temple being built, 
my own feeling is that that temple will only be rebuilt on a foundation of peace among the nations. And the fact is, of course, that the, the nations such as the Muslims and the Christians are not idolaters. They do all believe in one transcendent God. So, uh, going on, verse 11. Vayerid ha'ayat, and the bird of prey, I think also that an ayat describes a hawk, al hapigarim. The bird of prey came down on the carcasses. Vayashev otam Avraham, and oh, Avram, excuse me, I want to be careful there. And uh, Abram uh, shooed them away. That's the way we said. What is interesting, though, is it doesn't say only on the birds, right? It is, I believe, it is referring to all of them. And the fact that Abram shooed them away, shooed away the birds of prey that wanted to, uh, you know, devour the carcasses is interesting as to what that what might that what might that significance of the fact that Abram it doesn't say he just shooed away the birds of prey from the doves or the pigeons it's about all the carcasses right so what is that sig suggesting to us if these animals represent other nations so i'll leave that as a question ha'ayat the uh, bird of prey who of so this word ayat is uh, an unusual word, and Rashi wants to help us with it. Hu of, it is a type of bird. Al shem shehu at v'sho'ef et ha'nevelot. And the fact that it, it's called an ayat because it, it, it is urgent and swoops down uh, on carcasses. Latush ale ochel, to dart on the food. And he gives an example in Samuel, first book of Samuel, chapter 15, the ta'at el hashlal, and it pounced upon the booty. Okay, so this ayat is referring has to do with pouncing on of some kind. Well, in this case, with a bird swooping down on al hapegarim. So the word peger has to do with carcass. And it is also something that there's something sort of disgusting about a carcass. So the pagarim refer to the bitarim, these pieces of the animals. And he says, farim acherim, there are manuscripts or, or versions of Rashi, ha pagarim, that it translates metargaminan, that we, uh, in, in the Rashi, he goes on to say that the word pagarim, the targaminan piglaya, that it needs to be translated as piglaya. And that's because a resh and a lamed are, are, are changeable from Aramaic into Hebrew. Ella, mi tochshahu galu the targim. Okay, but he says that they were used to translating ish bitro, right? Because it's talking about the one one uh, to its companion or its other side, the other half of it, by Yahav Pilgaya, right? He placed Pilgaya. So you notice the transposition of the Gimel and the Lamed, right? We have Piglaya, which refers to the carcasses, and we've got Pilgaya that comes from the word Paleg, which means to divide. Nitchalef lahem tevat Piglaya lefilgaya. He says they transposed uh, the word piglaya into pilgaya. The targumo hapagarim, and it and he translates into Aramaic. Their versions, I guess, that translate the word pagarim to pilgaya, to the house. But it's he says the chol hametagem chain toe. And anyone who translates in this way is making a mistake. Because you really can't uh, understand the tarim pieces, right? The pegarim to carcasses. A piece is not a carcass. She targomo pilgaya. 
because the the um, the word betarim has the correct translation of paleg to divide. U pigarim and carcasses targumo piglaya. Piglaya. Then you can say the Aramaic translation is piglaya, lashon pigu, which has to do with the association of the word pagu, kamo, and we have this word actually in Hebrew later on in the book of Leviticus. It refers to a sacrifice where if the priest intended when he made the sacrifice to eat it uh, past its prescribed time, sacrifices had to be consumed within a specific amount of time. It varied depending on the sacrifice. But if the priest, when he made the sacrifice intended to eat it outside of it, the sacrifice is considered pigul. It's unacceptable. And in fact, the transgression for consuming it beyond its time is karate, is a serious divine um, punishment. So he says, kamo pigulhu, when it says in, in Leviticus chapter 7 that that particular sacrifice is pigul. In other words, no longer is it a sacrifice. It's more of a carcass, you know, simply a something that is has the association of being disgusting. Lashon peger, right? It's got the same understanding as the word peger. Kach shamati mi pi rabbein. This is interesting, right? That he says, this is what I learned at the mouth of Rabbeinu, our rabbi, Yehuda Barebi Shmuel. So he mentions, again, one of his teachers, the Chain Hagisa, and there's a lot of editorializing in this particular Rashi. It says, and this is in fact the version of the text, Barashi Kitveyad, in, in Rashi manuscripts. Kitveyad is a manuscript. Uvichitveyad Acheret, but in a different manuscript, because there are various manuscripts that have survived. Ketiv there's a different version. It says, this is what Rabbeinu Meir Bereb Ishmael. It's a different rabbi. Instead of Rabbi Yehuda, it says Rabbi Meir, our Rabbi Meir, the son of Shmuel. Vayash, Vayashov. Let me make sure I have the word correctly here. No, Vayashev. Sorry, Vayashev. And I was pronouncing it from a different root. Vayashev. He says, the word Vayashev, Lashon Neshiva, that it has to do, has the meaning of sort of blowing, right? Uvahafracha, and flying away. So in other words, he he um, shooed away, I think would be a good way of translating this. Ukamo, and he says, example, in Psalm 147, Yashev Rucho, he, he, he causes his wind to blow. Remes, and what was this? What was the symbolism here? Sheyavo David ben Yishai, that David, son of Jesse, would come, l'chalotam, to uh, to try and uh, bring them to an end, in other words, to to finish off the idolatry, the idolatrous nations. The ein mani hinoto, but they do not allow him to do that. That would be the act of Abraham shooing away these birds, min the the that is that the divine instruction would prevent him, would not allow him to do this, until the king Messiah would in fact come. That that these other nations are going to continue to exist until messianic time. And with this, I am going to conclude today's lesson. So we'll take a look at Mark the Place. This is a, a really significant uh, passage. It really is. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot to it. And uh, I'm mark that there. And mark the page. And I'm going to stop the share. And if there are any comments, I'm happy to take them if you'd like. Otherwise, we will stop the lesson. Okay. Thank you.